I'm Chris Englan. I'm coming together with Christine from Switzerland all the way down here to Barcelona. Uh, and it's very confusing because when I talk to my colleagues from here, they always say, we're not down, we're up in Spain. Uh, but from Switzerland, it's a slightly shifted perspective. And what I will talk with you about is the AR discovery challenges that we face in different kinds of projects. But first of all, I want to give a little shout out to my employer, which is a, a small regional uh, university in Switzerland. I'm the director of the Blended Learning Center uh, there at the HTB Kur, which is uh, very near to the Hose or San Moritz in Switzerland. So if you like skiing, you probably have passed that place. Um, and we are a very nice small university there uh, with just a few thousand students. A few thousand means two thousand or so. Um, so we're very tiny, like the schools we have in the Alpine areas as well, like six students per school, uh, also a very exclusive um, situation you have. They allow me to do the stuff that I'm doing. They give me also additional staff to employ to do the work better than I do. So I like to thank them a lot, although they're probably not going to hear that. <laughs> so. When Christine asked me to join the Augmented Reality Discovery Working Group uh, about half a year ago, I was wondering, okay, why is that? Because I'm not really doing anything related to augmented reality. And if you look from augmented virtuality to augmented reality, I'm probably in the area of mixed reality. Um, but even that is highly questionable if you mm -hmm. ask me. Because my real question, I think that's the reason why I'm here, is my real passion is the experiences in multi-device ecologies. So when we look at the publishing frameworks that we see today, we see a one-to-one -one interaction, one user, one device. But in reality, in Switzerland at least, already two-thirds of the users in Switzerland carry with them pretty much on a daily or at least weekly basis, three or more devi mobile devices. Three or more devices, that's quite a lot. So we're not talking about the single device interface uh, anymore. We actually talk about ecologies already for the majority of the people. And we, if we look at the developments that are happening, we can project in five years in the future, that would be almost 100% coverage. And uh, by that time, when Swiss, uh, the Swiss reach that, the others are around there, 75%. So let's talk about uh, discovery and what is my business with it. So one of the questions I ask myself is, how do we want to discover things? How do we want to discover our environment? And if I look at search and recommendation algorithms that I find around or uh, following the paradigm search, and discovery, then I find it very frustrating that we really don't want to see the same things again. For example, when I uh, just ate, I don't want to see more restaurants. Yeah, I'm already stuffed. I don't want to need to go again. Or if I spend already four hours in a museum, I just came out, I'm a greater need of a cafe or a bar than I am in another museum, right? Uh, it totally makes sense. Although most recommendation algorithms are not tailored toward that. Um, <clears throat> specifically, if we look at the content authors, augmented reality browsers that channel everything into a single perspective. And you can continue that direction. Um, what it also needs to do, the discovery mechanism, it needs to create meaningful connections from one step I do to the other. For example, when I'm on a business trip and just before a meeting, I'm not interested in finding a gym, rather than I'm interested in planning my way around, so probably <coughs> more local uh, transportation or nice ways to get from one meeting point to the other. And the other thing, the final thing around discovery is uh, follow the rhythms of the user. And this is really a hard thing to do, but basically it's, uh, it's the same example like Christine said, if I have dinner around 6 p.m., uh, then I might be interested in uh, restaurants around that time because I tend to be hungry because of the daily routine I have. It uh, varies obviously from country to country, but the routine is really what triggers uh, basic stimuli and basic interests 
in certain information that you have when you're abroad. So when I talk about these things, um, I will show you a lot of diagrams um, that are very, very abstract. I'm not going to the heart of the beat. Uh, there are real world examples to it, and that's uh, coming from a project that I've been working at over the last year or so, uh, which is about contextualized data access and data enrichment. And uh, you see from the uniform guys here, uh, it's the military security context. And um, that one is doing the augmented reality experience. We're talking about these guys using portable devices in order to get access to information that they need on the spot. And what is very different, difficult for these people, they work in a very fluent environment. So their environment is constantly changing. It's not like the bus station that was there yesterday will be there tomorrow because somebody has bombed it. Okay, this happens in crisis situation pretty much all the time. So the difficulty for them is to have the right information, the updated information with them as they go. Yeah, and they have a whole bunch of uh, problems related to that. So the experiences I talk you with you about are basically coming from these kind of fluid situations, fluid settings that I'm working at. Uh, I use a framework uh, that comes from Zimmermann, Lorenz, and Oppermann from around 2007. It was published. The framework is a little bit older, but basically it categorizes context experiences uh, around five dimensions. So we have the obvious location dimension, we have the temporal dimension, we have activity, how active are you or how active is, the, is your sensor base, uh, you have the identity, the preferences that you have, uh, what defines your, yourself or the device or something, and then you have relations. Relations you share with the world, with your environment, how you interact with things. And this basically shapes the experiences that you have. So when we look at discovery, we can look at discovery in one way, and uh, the way I do is um, in terms of automatic context matching. So it's about optimizing things. And here you see how the idea of this uh, framework is basically working. Contextualization works when you match certain context dimensions from your experiences with the experiences of others or with the context of others, or other settings. And these can be along different uh, dimensions, and they match into your experiences and can be used to overlap. And this is really um, a hard problem, and again, this is not my stuff. This comes from a colleague of mine, Marco Specht, who did this work in um, 2000, 2009. <clears throat> Around the same time, when I worked with them, I've been working on a technical discovery process. And what I show here is like a five-step uh, process on the technical level, how you come from the raw data, that is the content or information that you want to use in your situation, towards the experience. And what I, when I talk about experience, I don't talk about tools or content, I talk actually something that happens outside of the computer, inside your head, how you experience the interaction with the content. So when we talk about augmented reality, most of the work I see happens on the presentation layer. It's important, it's not easy to do, but basically if you ask me, not my thing. Uh, also happens that I'm not very good at computer graphics and these kind of things, so probably it goes hand in hand. And then you have uh, the layers underneath it, it's a controlling layer. This is like the business logic of your applications, of the framework that you're working in. And uh, then you have underneath that an aggregation layer, how you pull things together. And uh, finally you have the sensing and collection area where you draw things, where, where comes the temperature from, where is the content stored, and all these things. This is then the collection layer. What this framework is offering us, it helps us to isolate certain problems in the process and focus only on these problems without reconcerning really about the other layers. And what makes it also interesting 
it lets us isolating the discovery process within the augmented reality experience development. And in my point of view, this would be around aggregation and controlling. So how do we create the right contextual filters? And how do we develop the context matching and the context selection within the application context? And if we look today at the mobile devices that people have in their pockets, um, probably I'm coming back from the future, I have no <laughs> idea. But actually, having almost unlimited device capabilities, it's pretty much there. So uh, we can run the full aggregation controlling and presenting process pretty much on the device. And uh, I excluded the sensing and collecting here, which could be also put on the device. <coughs> then we have things like collaboration, multi-device environments. So I separated it again. But basically, the whole experience, how do you generate the data for the experience can run on the portable device already. So the big challenge then would be only how do we get the data to the users. And I had a, sl a similar slide like that, and Christina asked me to, to change that. And the idea is to look again uh, at the first step, where is the data coming from? And as I told you, I'm talking about uh, multi-device ecologies and augmentation within multi-device ecology. So what is out there to discover, and how do we interact there with that? And most of the application that I see, again, is happening on the business intelligence part. It's the apps that come within uh, augmented reality browsers or specialized applications that you have built that are often coupled with cloud services in one way or the other, and that's basically it. But it's a much broader field. We have also ambient screens. We have the Internet of Things that is coming up, and this can be also used to augment our, our experiences and provide input into the augmentation. We have sensor networks, things and think big, yeah? Things in terms thing in terms of smart cities and smart buildings. How can we tap in these kind of sensor networks? And then we have also other mobile apps. And as Christine said, vendors could be interested in that. And they actually are. How can we exchange data from one app to the other? This is already working with Android and iOS. Windows and all the mobile platforms that we have in place. And what we see already coming up is that we can start to exchange data with our new smart TVs uh, and the first things without being constrained to a cloud service uh, like the famous Fitbit services that uh, we had in the Internet of Things area for quite some time. And then there are obviously also a whole bunch of challenges with our experiences. And I arranged that in an operational way here. So basically we have privacy problems. How do we exchange contextual data of the user? How do we query information? How do we pull in uh, data for the user without exposing the user too much to probably parties that the user is not so fond of? <laughs> um, we have disruption. Disruption can be of several kinds of way in the, uh, a problem or a challenge uh, within the experience. Disruption can be the disruption of the activity of the user, but it can be also the disruption of the data connection. So if you have huge content and you need to pull it every time the user accesses a certain perspective, uh, then you're constrained with the bandwidth limitation. And uh, Christine had the idea that in the future, we have unlimited bandwidth and it's extreme connectivity all the time. Um, I wonder whether you travel Switzerland recently. We get disrupted all the time. We have 100% coverage, but still a lot of disruption. Then we have a data aggregation challenge. How and where and when do we aggregate the data? We have the connectivity problem, as I already mentioned. And then we have the attention problem. Most of the time, and my favorite example is the Navigon app um, that is offered for iOS. Most of the time, you draw the attention to the app in a certain setting. And when you do that, it's probably not the best time 
when uh, the day uh, to pull the data. So probably you want to pull the data earlier. And Lovigon does it very tricky thing for me at least. So they have a navigation app that I need every now and then when I rent a car. I don't need to use it on a daily basis because I use uh, public transport in Switzerland. They're very convenient to do. Um, whenever I pull out the Navigon app when I'm abroad, it tells me your maps are outdated. Oh my god, two gigabyte of data to download over a hotel internet. No way to do that. So we have to keep these things in mind. And I arranged these uh, five challenges in a functional way, as I already mentioned. So you think have to think them in terms of opposites along this pentagon for of the experience. So privacy concerns connectivity and data aggregation. So what information really needs to go over the connection and how is that information used to aggregate? Is that really needed to aggregate and collect information? Connectivity is related to privacy and disruption because we lose connections all the time. Disruption is related to attention and connectivity because we disrupt, disrupt the attention of the user or we may disrupt the attention of the user when we show the wrong information. And that attention is connected to data aggregation and disruption. So these are the challenges that we came across in the different projects I've been working at and to the extreme and that military setting that I'm showing to the past. They had all these problems at, in one go, yeah? Very strange things. So what we did was we addressed privacy and connectivity uh, problems by focusing on the data aggregation aspects. So basically, we used cloud services, we probably use ambient uh, screens and Internet of Things. We use external sensor networks, but the aggregation actually can take place on the user's devices, where also the control process happens and the presentation happens. And also, we may draw in data from other apps into the aggregation process. And that really solves us by placing the data aggregation on the user's device that we don't need to expose that much private data to cloud service or sensor uh, service providers. Because we can use generic queries. Hey, give me everything in Barcelona. <laughs> or um, give me the all the devices that are in these buildings. Yeah. It doesn't tell me anything about the user. It just gives me the whole bunch. And we're not talking about that much of data if we look at machine readable stuff. So. Pulling in that kind of information is often easier than it looks like. But then the aggregation and all the personalization happens on the user's device, which is much more convenient for the end users than it would be to send out all the private information, although it would reduce the data sets dramatically. But then you would expose your personal situation to potentially partners that you are not interested in, that you know your sexual interests, that you want them to know your social relations, and so on and so forth. And what is also interesting here that we can draw in this process through multiple channels without relying on one, what do you call that, catalog provider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I draw a few scenarios how that could work. Um, on the AR Discovery Wiki, on Wikiar, I invite you to uh, visit our Wiki and read that, that piece. And now look at, have a look at a um, discovery example. So what I basically did in the military setting, we used OpenStreetMaps data, and uh, they have a lot of interesting things happening there. They have rich metadata and linked data for pretty much all the places in the world that you and data that you wouldn't even think of that would be available. So they have hierarchical data through the geolocation information that they store. So you can drill out down from the global level to the regional level, through the country level, uh, sub-regions, cities, villages, neighborhoods, and so on, all hierarchical structures, even down into the building level. Um, they have somewhat structured <coughs> metadata. And then with metadata, I mean the tags that they use. And for the Barcelona area, I saw that yes is the preferred keywords for pretty much everything. So be it 
uh, airports, shops, sporting settings. 80% of the tags that are used in the OpenStreetMap data set in the Barcelona area are yes. Yeah, they are somewhat yes. And it's used about 50% for all the objects in the Barcelona area. So you see there's also a bunch of geographical aspects in the data set that are not um, related to any kind of tagging. But also they have plenty of link data. For example, there are 710 links to Wikipedia settings connected to a location. So we can use that link in order to drill down into Wikipedia in order to pull in content that is already pre present for the location without building any new stuff and enriching the augmented reality experience that we have. We have web 533 website references, we have 3,000, almost 4,000 postcode references that we then can link to postcode uh, databases that provide us additional information. We have 166 emails of shops and phone numbers, uh, almost 500. And we have plenty of contextual data, like language support. For many stores, the OpenStreetMap data, when they have a store, they store also which languages they accept to be spoken to the clerks. Uh, they have, many of them have opening hours. They have operator information if you are not interested to go to a specific chain or so, or if you are interested to get only organic information, that operator information would be included. Uh, and they have accessibility information for the sites. So for example, if you have special interest support, like for people in wheelchairs, they provide the information, which are the buildings that you can access with the wheelchair and where the entrances are. So that's a big help that's already there. But again, it's a little bit messy what they are doing. So this is what it looks underneath. There are basically two data structures um, that give us the geolocation, they give us a unique ID that we could use to link up external content, for example, a building, 3D building model. We could hook in into the metadata of that building model that we can use in AR uh, with the OpenStreetMap ID, and then we could uh, link the additional data into that data set. We have public names in points and areas um, that give us the information if this we has already a public name that could be a city name, a neighborhood name, but that could be also a special name of a building or a museum. And then we have a whole bunch of category tags. What you see basically here is that the points have only man-made and highways or if it's a barrier point. And the areas, they have all kinds of stuff like airports, boundaries, buildings, geological sites, tourism site, land use, and so on and so forth. So that made me think, okay, are we actually talking about points of interest or areas of interest? And basically everything from that perspective is an area of interest. Nonetheless, this is what we have. And down here, in the other text, this is where all the linked data is stored, which is a complex data set. That we look at. So from that data we drill into the discovery process. So basically in the military context that I sh just showed you we draw in from the location service this open street map information into a location manager that runs on the device. So basically what it does is the user says I'm in the Barcelona area give me all of that information and it drags from the location service. And then we have a task service that gives the user some experience about some information about what they are intended to do when they are doing uh, field work. So it tells them, go visit the mayor, or collect um, the schooling situation, or find out about the medical or the sanitation situation in a certain area. And that kind of task information is also put onto the device. When the, when the people go out, they have no connectivity whatsoever to any data networks. So all this information is on their device already. So they use the device sensors, they use this pulled in data in order to aggregate information that is already filtered for the user settings. 
and then we do the context matching next on the next level and that will be then in terms of experience that will be a task focus and we simply focus with that respect on the activity dimension the location dimension and the temporal dimension so locations have a location dimension and a temporal dimension because we also have a historical mm -hmm. development in many cases and the task dimension have a location dimension and uh, the tasks have location dimensions and activity and what we do is basically we overlap uh, these different data layers and see if we have rematches and identify whether users have performed their tasks or if there's still something to do in order to bring them to their attention on their mobile devices where next to do or not to focus on activities that they have already completed. So my personal challenges in implementing this kind of discovery were uh, de device-friendly data, and that basically means device-efficient data formats for exchange and retrieval, also on the device. So if we look at the APIs that we find for the different um, service providers, we find that they're pretty messy, they're clumsy, most of them still use XML, uh, which is a heavy duty format that is not so easy to use on mobile device. We use it, uh, it requires a lot of performance to, to run it and so on. Um, to identify the available data sources is also a big challenge. As I mentioned, we have linked data in the data sets, but what do they link to? They often link to web pages, which are heavy to download, are hosted on slow servers somewhere in the Middle East probably, connected to the global internet through thin data lines. So it's not very easy to get hold on the data in the first place, but then this data is often not designed for machine use. It's often designed for human end users. So there is a lack of specification on my end, to my end, where we can have an easy way to figure out from general homepage description to figure out where do we find that data that is interesting for machine use. And then we have the integration of the different data sources <coughs> that is related to APIs and data structures. And if we look at the geospatial area, we see uh, there is not one standard, there's a gazillion of standards that they use and if we took in procedural aspects as well, we have the same picture, so it grows exponentially, the kind of API and data structure problem that we have. And I think if we really want to make discovery happen, we need to clean up the space a little bit. So, I have something to offer to you in the coming days. We are gonna launch an OSAM point of interest uh, service that allows you to draw in a little bit cleanup version of the OSAP data, uh, more consumer and device oriented, uh, cleaner data and have easier access to the different categorization and the linked data, rather than that you have to process all that uh, complex data sets yourself. This is gonna launch probably next weekend or the weekend after that. It depends on where I find the time. And what I want to discuss later on with you are these two questions, basically, what are your discovery challenges? And uh, where do you need more interoperability in order to connect to other services? Where do you see the challenges that you have when you work with your applications or with your solutions at the very moment? So here you have the pointers, my email address, my Twitter account. You see uh, on SlideShare the presentations that I did in the past years. And there you see easily that I didn't do anything on augmented reality and also connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. <laughs>